Chapter 5 The Invalid When Marie finally awoke, she found herself in her own cozy bed. Sun was streaming through her windows, and the outsides of the panes were covered with beautiful frost flowers. Dr. Wendell Stern was sitting beside her. She's awake, he said gently to Marie's mother. In an instant, Mrs. Stahlbaum was at her daughter's side, looking Marie over very anxiously. Oh, mother, Marie cried. Are the horrible mice gone? Is Nutcracker safe? Marie's mother frowned. Don't talk nonsense, child, she said. It was very naughty of you to stay up so late. You cut your arm on the glass-paneled cabinet, and Dr. Wendell Stern says you nearly ended up with a useless left limb. Thank goodness I woke at midnight and came looking for you. You were lying in front of the cabinet, bleeding frightfully. Fritz's soldiers and several broken toys were scattered around you. Nutcracker lay on your bleeding arm, and your left shoe was halfway across the parlor. Oh, mother, Murray said in a hushed voice. That was the evidence of a huge battle between the dolls and the mice. The mice were about to capture poor Nutcracker, so I threw my shoe at the terrible Mouse King. That is the last thing I remember. Dr. Wendell Stern looked meaningfully at Maria's mother. It's all right, child, Mrs. Stahlberm said gently. The mice are gone, and Nutcracker is safe and sound in the toy cabinet. Maria felt better when she heard that Nutcracker was safe, but she still had to stay in bed and take medicine for several days, and her arm was very sore and achy, which made it hard to do things. Marie was very bored sitting in bed all day long, but in the evenings her mother sat with her and told wonderful stories. She had just finished the one about Prince Fardarkin, when the door opened and Godfather Drosselmeyer burst in. I must see with my own eyes how my little Marie is getting along, he said. His yellow coat tails flapped behind him as he came into the room. Marie looked at those coat tails and shrieked, Oh, Godfather, how awful you were, she said. I saw you cover the clock to prevent it from striking and scaring away the mice. I heard you call the Mouse King, and why didn't you help Nutcracker? It's all your fault that I cut myself and have to lie here in bed. Mrs. Stahlbaum's eyes widened in alarm. Godfather Drosselmeyer made all kinds of strange faces. Then he began to chant. Pendulum could only whisper, couldn't tick, not even a click. All clocks stopped their ticking, then struck loud, dong, bong. Dolls, don't let your heads hang down. Bells are ringing, the battle is over. Nutcracker is oh so safe in clover. Here's the owl on downy wing, come to scare the mouse king pendulum swing and tick and click burr and purr whirr and stir marie stared at godfather drosselmeyer in fright because he looked even stranger than usual his arms were jerking about as if he were a puppet before marie could ask him to stop fritz came in and began to laugh Goodness, Godfather Drosselmeyer, he said, you are being very funny today. You make me think of the jumping jack that I just threw away. Mrs. Stahlbaum looked quite concerned. That certainly is a strange way to go on, she said. What is the meaning of it? Did you never hear my watchmaker's song? Godfather Drosselmeyer replied with a laugh. Then he sat down on Marie's bed. Don't be angry with me for not gouging out all of the Mouse King's fourteen eyes, he said. <laughs>
that would have been quite impossible. But to make up for it, I have something you will enjoy a great deal. And with that, he reached into his pocket and pulled out Nutcracker. His jaw was nicely mended and his teeth had been put back in. Marie took Nutcracker and hugged him tightly. Now you can see how good Godfather Drosselmeyer is to your Nutcracker, Mrs. Stallbaum said. Godfather Drosselmeyer nodded at Marie. Even nicely mended, he said. You must admit that Nutcracker is not at all handsome. If you like, I can tell you how the ugliness came into his family. Have you ever heard of Princess Perlipat, Witch Mouserinx, and the clever clockmaker? Fritz interrupted. Say, Godfather Drosselmeyer, what happened to Nutcracker's sword? You've repaired him quite nicely, but what's become of his sword? Godfather Drosselmeyer seemed annoyed by Fritz's question. Why must you always complain, boy? He asked. I've mended his body. He'll have to find his own sword. Right, Fritz agreed. If he's a worthy chap, he'll find a good weapon. So, Marie, Godfather Drosselmeyer repeated, have you heard the story of Princess Perlipat? Oh, no, Marie said. Oh, please tell it, Godfather Drosselmeyer. Mrs. Stahlbaum looked a bit anxious. I hope it isn't as horrid as your stories generally are. On the contrary, dear lady, said Godfather Drosselmeyer. This is a fairy tale. Chapter 6 The Story of the Hard Nut Marie settled back against her pillows, and Godfather Drosselmeyer began to tell the tale. From the moment she was born, Perlipat was a princess. For you see, her mother was a queen, and her father was a king. The king was overjoyed with his lovely daughter as she lay in her cradle. He danced and hopped about singing, Hurrah! Hurrah! Has anyone ever seen something as lovely as my little Perlipat? And all of his ministers, generals, presidents, and officers hopped about and replied, No, not ever! Indeed, Princess Perlipat was a beautiful girl. Her tiny face looked as though it had been woven from delicate rose-colored silk. Her big blue eyes were the color of azure stones. Her hair curled like golden threads and she was born with two rows of pearly white teeth, which she put to use almost immediately. Two hours after she was born, she bit the Lord High Chancellor's finger. This may have caused some alarm if Perlipat were a normal little girl. However, the entire kingdom was thrilled with this event. They felt it clearly showed that the tiny princess was not only beautiful, but intelligent and spirited as well. While the king and his kingdom were filled with joy over little Perlipat, the queen seemed uneasy. She required that little Perlipat's cradle be constantly and closely guarded. Guards were stationed at the nursery doors. Two head nurses kept watch at the cradle, and six additional nurses were positioned around the room at night, each holding a large tomcat on her lap. What's more, each of these nurses was required to pet the tomcat all night long so that it never ceased purring. Nobody quite understood why these precautions were necessary, but I know why and I shall tell you now. Not long before, there was a large gathering of kings and princes at little Perlipat's father's court. The king planned great entertainments, including tournaments, plays, and balls. He also planned a magnificent feast of puddings and sausages. Then he rode out in his carriage and personally invited the kings and princes to attend his supper, 
which, he fibbed, would be a simple soup and nothing more. Upon returning home, the king went to his wife and said, Only you, my dear, know exactly how I like my puddings and sausages. The queen, who understood her husband quite well, knew that he had intended for her to make the puddings and sausages herself. Since she enjoyed being in the kitchen and loved her husband, she agreed. The great golden sausage kettle was brought out of storage, along with the silver casseroles. The ladies-in-waiting built a crackling sandalwood fire, and the queen put on her damask apron. Very shortly after that, the succulent aroma of pudding broth drifted throughout the castle. The king was so drawn to the smell that he excused himself from the council room and dashed into the kitchen. There he embraced his wife and spent a few divine moments stirring the broth himself. Calmed by the aroma and the stirring motion, he returned to work. Soon there came the critical time when the meat was to be cut into small pieces and browned on silver spits. The ladies-in-waiting retired, for the queen had decided to do this task alone. But as soon as the meat began to sizzle, a voice was heard in the great palace kitchen. Give me some of that, sister, the voice said. I want some. And I am a queen as well as you. The queen knew exactly who was speaking. It was Madame Mouserinx. Madame Mouserinx had lived in the castle for many years and claimed to be of royal blood. She was queen of Mausolea, for certain, and had her own large congregation under the stove. Although the queen did not admit to being related to Madame Mouserinx, she was a kindly woman. Come out then, she said. Of course I will share my meat with you. Madame Mouserinx wasted no time in scurrying out from under the stove. She greedily gobbled down every piece of meat that the good queen handed to her. Then she called her aunts and uncles and cousins and five no-good sons, who all came out to share in the feast. The queen was so overwhelmed by the number of mice that she could not keep them from eating all the meat. Luckily, one of the ladies-in-waiting came into the kitchen and shooed the mice back under the stove. There was very little meat left for the king's sausages so little that the court mathematician was called in to carefully calculate how to divide the meat so as to stretch it as far as possible. Finally, the preparations were complete. Kings and princes arrived dressed in their finest robes. The king greeted them and they all sat down to supper. Wearing his crown and sitting at the head of the table, the king tasted the first course. No sooner had the first bite passed his lips than his skin paled and he turned his eyes to the heavens. Then the second course was served. After taking a single bite, he broke down and sobbed, woefully covering his face with his hands. The court physician rushed to the king's side and took the king's pulse. He began to apply very serious and powerful remedies. No one was sure what ailed the king so terribly, but it seemed to be gnawing at his very soul. Then, suddenly, the king seemed to recover somewhat, for he uttered three words, Too little meat. The queen knelt at his feet in despair, crying, Oh, my poor husband, what torture you have endured this day. The culprit is here at your feet. Madame Mouserinx, with her cousins and aunts and uncles and five sons, ate nearly all the meat. And before she could go on, the queen fell to the floor in a faint. The king seemed to have regained his senses, 
for he now jumped up in a rage. Chief lady in waiting, he cried, what is the meaning of this? The lady in waiting told the king what she knew, and the king vowed revenge on Madame Mouserinx and her family. The privy council was summoned, and it was decided that Madame Mouserinx should be tried for her life. Her property was confiscated. The king, however, worried that in spite of this, she might continue to eat the sausage meat. So he turned the matter over to the court clockmaker. This man's name was the same as mine, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer. He promised to drive Madame Mouserinx and all her relations from the palace forever. What he did, in fact, was to invent tiny machines and attach small pieces of cheese to them. He placed them all over Madame Mouserinx's dwelling. Madame Mouserinx was far too clever to let herself get caught in one of these traps. But though she warned her aunts and uncles and cousins and sons, they could not resist the bits of cheese. Each time they nibbled a delicious morsel, they were trapped by a tiny gate, taken to the kitchen, and duly executed. Madame Mouserinx was filled with despair and rage at her loss. While the king and his kingdom rejoiced, the queen knew they had not heard the last of the shrewd queen of Mausolia. And she was right, for Madame Mouserinx appeared before the queen as she was cooking her husband a chicken fricassee. My sons and my uncles and my cousins and my aunts are gone. Be warned, lady, that the queen of mice just might bite your little princess in two. Be warned. Then Madame Mouserinx vanished. The queen was so frightened that she dropped the fricassee in the fire, which made the king very angry. This was the second time Madame Mouserinx had ruined one of his favorite meals. <clears throat> Godfather Drosselmeyer cleared his throat then and declared that the children had heard enough for one night. And though Marie begged him to continue, he refused. Chapter 7 Revenge The next evening, Godfather Drosselmeyer returned to Marie's bedside and continued the story. Now you understand why the queen had her daughter guarded so carefully. She knew in her heart that Madame Mouserinx would eventually follow through on her threat. But the court astronomer declared that Tom Cat Purr and his brothers would be able to keep the clever mouse witch away from the cradle. And so they did, for a time. But one night, just after the clock struck twelve, one of the ladies-in-waiting awoke suddenly from a deep sleep. Everything in the nursery was deathly quiet. So quiet, in fact, that you might have been able to hear a termite munching away on the paneling. The lady-in-waiting looked up and saw a great, ugly mouse sitting on the edge of the cradle. Its horrid head was right on the princess's face. Springing to her feet, the lady-in-waiting screamed a scream of terror. In an instant, the entire nursery and all of the guards awoke. Madame Mouserinx, for she was indeed the mouse in the cradle, leapt down to the floor and scurried to a corner. The legislative counselors raced after her, but she had already disappeared through the crack in the floor. Awakened by all of the commotion, Perlipat began to cry. "'She's alive!' the ladies-in-waiting exclaimed gleefully, but when they looked upon her face, they gasped in horror. Her once small golden-haired head was now huge and bloated and sat upon a shrunken body. 
Her lovely blue eyes were now green and bulging, and her rosebud mouth had been transformed into a large gash that stretched from one ear clear across to the other. The queen nearly died of sorrow, and the walls of the king's study had to be covered with padding because he banged his head against them over and over, saying, Oh, what a miserable king am I! Of course, the king might have realized at this point that it would have been better to eat his sausages without any meat at all and leave Madame Mouserinx in peace under the stove. But he didn't think of that. Instead, he chose to blame everything on the clockmaker, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer, for failing to catch Madame Mouserinx in one of his traps. He issued a decree giving Drosselmeyer just four weeks to find a way to make Perlipat beautiful again. If he failed, he would be executed. Now, Drosselmeyer was a brilliant clockmaker, and he had faith in his craft and his luck. So he did the logical thing and set to work, taking Perlipat apart, unscrewing her hands and feet and carefully examining her insides. Unfortunately, he learned that the bigger she got, the more deformed she would become. Disheartened, he carefully put the princess back together again and slumped to the floor beside her cradle, where the king had commanded him to stay. Time passed, and soon it was the Wednesday of the fourth week. The furious king barged into the nursery, his eyes flashing with anger. Christian Elias Drosselmeyer, he raged. Cure the princess or prepare for death. Drosselmeyer wept bitterly, but Princess Perlipat seemed unfazed. She simply continued to crack nuts, a task that seemed to give her great satisfaction. Gazing upon the ugly Perlipat, Drosselmeyer suddenly realized the solution lay in her nut-cracking habit. After her transformation, she had cried and cried until, by a strange chance, she got her tiny hands on a nut. She cracked it at once and ate the nut meat, then lay in her cradle quite content with things. From then on, her nurses kept plenty of nuts on hand for Princess Perlipat. Oh, natural instinct, Drosselmeyer cried. Oh, mysterious, eternal connectedness of all things. You have shown me the secret's door. I shall knock on it, and it shall open. Drosselmeyer asked permission to leave so that he could meet with the court astronomer. Permission was granted, but the clockmaker had to be escorted and heavily guarded. Upon Drosselmeyer's arrival, the two men embraced and wept together, for they were good friends. Then they retired to secret quarters and began to read books dealing with all kinds of mysterious subjects. They read and read, and soon night was upon them. The astronomer consulted the stars and drew up Perlipat's horoscope. This was not an easy task, for the lines between the stars became tangled and confused. But at last Princess Perlipat's destiny was clear, as was the manner in which she could be released from her horrible spell. It was actually surprisingly simple. All the princess had to do was eat the nut meat of the nut Krakatuk. Now, the Krakatuk was a hard nut. So hard, in fact, that a steam locomotive could drive over it without hurting it in the least. This impossibly hard nut had to be cracked in Perlipat's presence by the teeth of a young man who had not yet shaved and had never worn boots 
Once the young man had cracked the nut, he was required to give it to the princess with his eyes closed. He then had to take seven steps backward without stumbling. It had taken Drosselmeyer and the court astronomer three days and nights to find the solution to Perlipat's problem. The very day before he was to be executed, Drosselmeyer announced the good news to the king. Elated, the king promised Drosselmeyer a diamond sword, four shiny medals, and two Sunday suits. It was then that Drosselmeyer confessed he had found the solution, but not the actual nut or the young man to crack it. Furthermore, he said, it would be quite difficult to do so. In that case, we'll go through with the execution, the king bellowed. Fortunately for the trembling Drosselmeyer, the king had enjoyed his noon meal that day. Feeling reasonable, he listened to the advice of the good and kind queen. She pointed out that Drosselmeyer had, in fact, found a way to break the spell on little Perlipat. Mishmash and nonsense, the king declared. But after a few long moments, he agreed to send Drosselmeyer and the court astronomer out to search for the Krakatuk. They could find the young man to crack it, he said, by advertising in local and foreign newspapers. And now Godfather Drosselmeyer interrupted the story again but he promised Fritz and Marie that he would finish it the very next night. Chapter 8 The Second Curse The lamps had just been lit the following evening when Godfather Drosselmeyer arrived. Taking a seat, he quickly resumed the story of the hard nut. Drosselmeyer and the court astronomer traveled far and wide for 15 long years. Still, they had not found even a small trace of the Krakatuk. I could go on for weeks and weeks about their adventures, but I shall simply say that Drosselmeyer in particular was terribly homesick for his hometown of Nuremberg. Oh, Nuremberg, Nuremberg, exquisite town, where the houses have windows both upstairs and down, he sang sadly. Hearing his dear friend sound so forlorn, the court astronomer began to weep and moan so loudly that he was heard all over Asia. But he then collected himself and announced that they could look for the Krakatuk anywhere. Why not look for it at home? You've got something there. Drosselmeyer agreed happily, and so the two men got to their feet and headed straight for Nuremberg. Tired from their journey, they knocked on the door of Drosselmeyer's cousin, who was a toy maker and gilder. Drosselmeyer told his cousin the long tale of Princess Perlipat, Madame Mouserinx, and the Krakatuk. He went on to explain his time spent with the King of Dates, how the Prince of Almonds had banned him from his kingdom, and how he had consulted the Natural History Society in Squirrel Town to no avail. When he'd heard the tale, the cousin's eyes opened wide, and he threw his cap into the air. "'Cousin!' he cried. "'You are a made man!' For unless I'm mistaken, I have the Krakatuk myself. A few moments later, he produced a small box with a medium-sized golden nut inside. How he had come to possess this nut was a story unto itself. But let us say that he watched a wagon ride over it without so much as cracking it. Thinking this quite strange, he bought the nut and dipped it in gold. The court astronomer examined the nut. Carefully scraping away the gilding, he found the word Krakatuk engraved on the shell in Chinese characters. 
there was excitement and merriment all around. They had found the Krakatuk. That night, after the two travelers had donned their nightcaps, the astronomer spoke up. One piece of good fortune never comes alone, he said. I believe we have also found the young man to crack the Krakatuk, your cousin's young son. Now, the cousin's son was a handsome lad. His smooth chin had never been shaved, and he had never worn boots. Just last Christmas, he had donned a beautiful red coat with gold trimmings and a shiny sword. Carrying his hat under his arm, he'd sported a fine wig with a pigtail. And in his fancy attire, he stood in his father's shop, cracking nuts for the ladies. They called him the Handsome Nutcracker. The astronomer set to work making the lad's chart, and by morning he was certain that the boy was indeed the one. But there are two things we must do, the astronomer said. First, you must make him a sturdy wooden pigtail. It must connect to his lower jaw so that a tug on one moves the other. And second, when we get back to the castle, we must hide the fact that we have brought the young man who will crack the Krakatuk. He must remain hidden until several others have broken their teeth trying to crack it. For then the king will promise his daughter's hand and the crown to the one who succeeds. The toy maker was thrilled that his son was going to become a prince, so much so that he handed the boy over to Drosselmeyer altogether. Drosselmeyer built a very sturdy pigtail indeed, which worked splendidly. The boy could crack the hardest peach pits with ease. Soon it was time for the nut cracking to take place. Young men came from far and wide and tried not to gasp when they saw the hideous princess. Her tiny body could barely support her huge, ugly head and underneath her gash of a mouth had sprouted a stringy white beard. One bare-faced, bootless traveler after another stepped forward and tried to crack the nut. One bare-faced, bootless traveler after another stepped forward and tried to crack the nut. Each broke his jaw without helping the princess even a tiny bit. As they were carried away to the dentist, they all called out, Oh, that was a hard nut. Full of despair, the king promised his daughter and his kingdom to the lad who could crack the Krakatuk. And so young Drosselmeyer stepped forward. The princess gazed at the young lad. Oh, I hope it is he who cracks the nut and becomes my husband, she cried. The lad politely saluted the king and queen, and then took the nut, put it between his teeth, and crack, crack, broke the shell into many pieces. He carefully removed the last few pieces of husk from the nut meat, then closed his eyes and handed it to the princess. No sooner had the kernel been chewed and swallowed, then the princess again became a beauty to behold. Her face was lily white, her lips rose red, and her hair formed delicate golden curls. Drums beat and trumpets blared. The populace rejoiced. The king gleefully danced about on one foot. The queen, who had fainted from joy and relief, had to be rubbed with perfume. The young Drosselmeyer, however, still had to take his seven steps backward. Trying to remain calm in spite of the excitement, he began. One, two, three. He was just putting his foot down for the seventh time when Madame Mouserink squeezed up through the floor with a terrible squeak. The lad stumbled and nearly fell. Within moments, 
the handsome boy was transformed into a hideous creature. His giant head and torso became much too large for his shrunken legs. His eyes bugged out and his mouth yawned from one side of his head to the other. His pigtail was gone and in its place was a wooden cloak that moved his jaw. Drosselmeyer and the court astronomer stared at the boy in horror. Then they saw Madame Mouserinx on the floor. The boy had squashed her neck and she would soon be dead. But with her last gasps of breath, she squeaked out another spell. Oh, Crackatuck, Crackatuck, because of you I must die. But the nutcracker you see soon will follow me. My beloved son with seven crowns will quickly bring Nutcracker down. His mother's death he will repay. Beware, beware, beware that day. The curse ended and Madame Mouserinx died. After the mouse's body was carried out by the court stovekeeper, the princess reminded the king of his promise. But when she looked upon the now ugly boy, she raised her hands to her face in horror. Take the horrid nutcracker away, she cried. Before he could protest, nutcracker was seized and removed from the castle. The king was enraged by the idea that a nutcracker could become his son-in-law. He blamed everything on the court astronomer and the clockmaker and had them banished from the kingdom. The court astronomer consulted his charts and made some interesting discoveries. In spite of his unfortunate looks, the nutcracking boy would still become a prince and a king. Breaking Madame Mouserink's spell would be more difficult. A lady would need to fall in love with him in spite of his awful appearance, and he would have to defeat the seven-headed mouse king. Once those feats were accomplished, he would become a handsome lad once again. Godfather Drosselmeyer cleared his throat. <clears> throat> That is the story of the hard nut children, he said. And now you know where the expression, that was a hard nut to crack, comes from, and also why nutcrackers are so ugly. Marie thought that Princess Perlipat was horrible and ungrateful, but Fritz was more concerned with nutcracker. If he was worth his salt, he would fight the king of mice right away and get his good looks back.